Hello everyone. Uh, today we'll cover chapter 11, which is on aggregate planning. Uh, as the name suggests, aggregate planning means, you may say, big picture approach to planning. Basically, aggregate means you put club together everything into one. You don't look at details at this stage. And uh, in this chapter, we'll also look at some of the techniques used. A definition of aggregate planning is given on the next slide which is intermediate range capacity planning usually covering 2 to 12 months. So if you look at the overall picture you have like short term short range plans which are more detailed and obviously there you are looking at less than two months of time horizon and things like uh, machine loading, job assignments like uh, which worker is going to work on which machine so all those details are worked out basically on a daily basis. In fact, every shift. And intermediate plans, they basically talk about employment, like how many people will be needed, let's say, in next next one year, and also how many output we need. So we are looking at a broad picture in a short, you may say, intermediate range between 2 and 12 months. And then beyond 12 months, you have long range plans. Like uh, we are looking at long term capacity, maybe next five or 10 years based on the demand, how much capacity will be needed. So how many machines to buy, how much space do we need, things like that. So location and layout, all that is included. So if you look at a broader picture, of uh, planning, at the high level, we have a business plan. So obviously that is a long term. And the data or the input used are corporate strategies and policies, economic competitive and political conditions, and aggregate demand forecast. So all that is used for developing business plans. So it establishes operations and capacity strategies. The whole idea is that the business plan defines the framework within which aggregate plan is going to work. So the scope is defined by business plan. And aggregate plan establishes operations capacity. So how much capacity will be needed, let's say, in a year. And just as an example, let's talk about an automotive company and Suppose they plan that in aggregate, they will be making about 240,000 vehicles in a year. So at that stage, no detailed information is needed, like how many, say, F-series or how many Focus or for Ford Motor Company. So different model-wise breakup is not needed at aggregate plan. In fact, that is needed at master schedule. But at aggregate plan, you don't need those details. So aggregate planning, in turn, defines the framework or scope within which master scheduling will be done. Or you may say master production scheduling may be done. So MS, or master scheduling, establishes schedules for specific products. So you have those breakups needed at that stage. Now for aggregate planning, you need uh, good inputs. Things like uh, information on resources. So how much resources are available in terms of workforce and facilities. We also need demand forecast because uh, that will be obviously based on the capacity and that will be needed to get an idea like in a year how many units will be needed. So if we take that example of automobile and the demand is about say 240,000, so that's what is needed to develop the aggregate plan. And also one looks at the policies about subcontracting, whether the company will, based on the business plan, they allow subcontracting, uh, can there be overtime, what will be the inventory levels, what about uh, back orders? So all those policies need to be known as an input. What also we need for aggregate planning is cost. 
So if we decide to keep, for example, in a company, a certain amount of inventory, so what will be inventory carrying cost? How much annually we are going to spend for that? Amount of back orders, hiring, firing. So how much of that? Because any hiring or firing, it costs money. So uh, those costs has to be kept in mind. It's not that we hire, say, 20 people today and tomorrow we fire them. So that could lead to a lot of uh, cost what will be the overtime uh, policy and what will be cost associated with overtime inventory changes subcontracting so all that cost has to be known so these inputs for the aggregate planning the quality of the input has to be good so one has to be very careful while collecting this data similarly aggregate planning outputs generally will be a total cost plan so between two months or next one year, what is going to be total cost based on the plan. And also projected levels of inventory, uh, output, how much employment will be needed, how many people will be needed, subcontracting, uh, what percentage of units will be done outside, and back out ordering. So all those data will be output from this planning. So there are different strategies people follow some strategies are proactive. So proactive means we alter demand to match capacity. So all this planning ultimately is done to match demand with capacity. If there is a mismatch, then obviously certain strategies are needed. In this case, the first one, we try to alter the demand so that it matches the capacity. Whereas reactive is alter capacity to match the demand. So there is slight difference between the two. We'll look at some details. And also the third strategy is mix of these two. It may not be pure proactive or pure reactive, but it could be mix of the two. For proactive, what can be done to change the demand? So there are different ideas there. Uh, four of them are listed here. So the first one is pricing. So pricing is done uh, to shift demand from one period to another period. You may say from peak period to off peak period. So one example we can think of is uh, movie theaters. So obviously it's uh, difficult to change the capacity of a movie theater on a day to day basis. So the second or reactive option is ruled out. So what they do is they try to change the demand pattern using pricing strategies. So what they do is they try to give a discount to tickets, maybe for matinee or those periods where less people come for watching movie so that some of the peak demand is shifted to those periods. Some restaurants, they give early bird specials. So some price discounts if people come slightly early for a dinner. There are also strategies based on promotions. So for example, if the demand is low, so obviously promotion will, may help to improve the demand and also match the capacity. But if the demand, it, it, sometimes it could misfire. If uh, demand created by promotion is much higher than what capacity can fulfill, then there could be some issues. Back order is basically orders taken in one period and deliveries promised for a later period. So you take orders in one period and then you may say that the delivery will be done after one week, two weeks or maybe four weeks. The fourth one is new demand, especially for those situations where the demand is seasonal. So for example, some services and products may be needed in summer and may not be much in demand in maybe winter. For example, air conditioner, so may be needed more in summer, whereas may not be that much in winter. So sometimes what people do is uh, they try to create a new demand for some of the products and services in the other period where the demand is very low. Now coming to the second strategy we discussed where we try to alter the capacity itself. Uh, some options are given here. One is higher 
and layoff workers. So when the demand goes up, you hire more people, and when the demand goes down, you lay off some people. But that cannot be done every time. If you think in terms of skill level, then it could become really difficult because hiring skilled people and then laying them off in future you may not be able to attract uh, those skilled workers and also at a lower skill uh, if we have a situation where we hire people train them so that they can work in a quality manner company has to spend some money for training them and then they gain experience and once we lay off then we are again incurring some loss so hiring and firing is not that easy it's not like switch off a button that today it's on and tomorrow it, it is off so it is going to cost money a lot of money for the company because that process could be lengthy it could be very expensive other option is overtime or slack time so sometimes when the demand is more you may ask people to work overtime to complete the task maybe one extra shift or maybe coming on Saturday or Sunday and try to complete the job. What some companies do for slack time is they use that time when the worker has no work to train them. So that's another idea instead of firing them to develop their skills so that they are more effective in the future. Also some companies they depend on part-time workers because if a worker is working part-time and there may not be too much of commitment from the company in terms of paying their health insurance and retirement, those things. So laying them off may be easier. In some cases, especially if the demand is more and many of the other options are not available, then companies also try to keep inventories so that they produce those items when the demand is low and when the demand increases, then use the inventory to fulfill the demand. But with the inventories, there are so many other factors involved, like inventory carrying cost is going to be incurred by the company, and the things which are kept in inventory, uh, one has to take its care. Uh, there could be some damage and things like that. So uh, keeping inventory is not always the best solution. It may be a bit expensive. And uh, one point also I should make is inventories can be kept only for manufacturing so only for manufacturing situation you can keep inventory but if we are talking about service then obviously we cannot keep inventory so if let's say 10 seats are vacant on an airplane then nothing can be done we cannot store them anywhere so that we can use in future another option for increasing or changing capacity is subcontracting so there are different uh, strategy when the demand is not even when you have uneven demand different strategies are available so if you look at a in this picture so suppose we have a normal capacity and the demand is also given so in the first period here we have forecasted demand and capacity both are exactly the same so that's the best situation to have so demand equals normal capacity now in the second period the blue line is the forecasted demand so you can see this line here forecasted demand is less than the normal capacity so dotted line is the capacity so that's the second period and in the third period you have demand more than the capacity there could be two strategies one could be chase demand strategy so try to focus on demand and try to chase it so in the second period when the demand is less so output is below normal capacity is temporarily decreased to match the demand so what this company would do if they are following this strategy is to reduce the output that way they will try to match capacity similarly in the third period when the demand is more output is above normal capacity is temporarily increased to match the demand it could be by 
any of those options like using part-time workers or overtime or subcontracting. So that can be used. So basically you are changing your capacity as and when the demand changes. The next strategy is level output strategy. So as the name suggests, it doesn't matter whatever may be the demand, we try to keep output constant. So in the second period when the demand decreases, so what based on this strategy what people will do is to continue to produce at the normal level. So because demand is less and we keep on producing slightly higher, so that will make inventory to grow. So you can see there inventory goes up. And in the third period when the production is low and the demand is more, so initially demand can be met by the inventory that we have and that's how match between capacity and uh, demand is made on a longer run. Coming to techniques that are used for aggregate planning, so basically there are two broad categories. One is trial and error. So many things are subjective. Uh, you cannot like optimize aggregate plan. So there is trial and error methods. Things that work, maybe people try for some time. If it doesn't, try to modify the strategy. And the second one is developing math models. So using mathematical models, try to optimize. Whichever method is used, these are some of the steps. Determine demand for each period. So that's basically input to aggregate planning. Determine capacities for each period. So this comes from the capacity planning. So what is available? Identify policies that are pertinent. So remember we are doing all these things within a scope or framework of a business plan. So we have to see what policies we can follow, what capacity do we have. And once we have that data, then determine unit cost. So this unit cost would, could be developed for the normal time, overtime, or subcontracting and things like that. And then develop alternative plans and cost for each one of those situations. And then select the best plan that satisfies objectives. So if it is trial and error, obviously you may not be able to get the best plan the first shot. So in that case, return to step five and then choose the another alternative and see if it works. As an example of doing some of these calculations, we can look at example number one. So in example one, if you look into your book, there are six different periods. So we have one, two, three, four, five, and six different periods are there. And then we have the forecast available for each period. So this is the demand forecast. 200 each for first two periods and then 300, 400, 500, and 200. So the total demand for these six periods, the period could be weeks or months, 1800. Now if we look at the output, so you could have under output, like if it is a regular output or overtime or subcontracting. So because we have 1800, so if we divide 1800 by 6, we get 300 as output for each period. So this 300 I can write for each of the six periods so that the total demand is met. And in this specific problem, we don't have overtime and subcontracting. So we can calculate output minus the forecast. So you have 300 minus 200, so the difference is 100. So based on the output, we have made 100 extra units. So that's why we get 100 here, 100 for the next period, 0, negative 100. So that's the shortfall, negative 200, and 100. 
but overall the difference is zero now we can calculate inventory so for inventory we calculate beginning inventory ending inventory and from that we can get average so we are assuming beginning inventory is zero and because 100 will be left after meeting the forecasted demand so ending inventory in period one is going to be 100 so that will be the beginning inventory for the second period and because we get 100 more so ending inventory will be 200 and then that goes to the next period and because the difference is zero so this 200 remains as it is so that 200 again goes to the next period but there was a shortfall so that will be fulfilled by the inventory so our inventory at the end of period 4 is going to be 100 and that goes to the next period and you can see the shortfall was 200 so our inventory will be consumed totally and if I create one more row for a backlog so there was no backlog in these periods but here it is going to be a backlog of 100 and then in the next period you fulfill that backlog so your starting and ending inventories will be 0 0 so if we take the average of beginning and ending inventory so you have 50 150 200 150 50 and 0 so the total here is 600 and this one is 100 now based on the cost as you can see in example 1 we can similarly calculate the total cost by multiplying these numbers by appropriate cost so for example regularly we are producing 300 units and you can see regular time uh, the dollars is two dollar per skateboard so if you multiply this 300 by 2 you get 600 dollars for period 1 so this way we can multiply all the data points by their appropriate dollars and get a total so the total came to 4700 dollars so basically it means that uh, using this approach or plan uh, we are going to incur 4700 dollars for the period so there are different techniques people use uh, there are like graphical and chart it's trial and error you may try to change few things and then see what will be the total cost so it is intuitively appealing because we understand what we are doing easy to understand and the only thing is solution not necessarily optimal note that in real life a solution sometimes need not be optimal but more important thing is it has to be practical so because of that people don't go for too complicated mathematical models at this stage to find a solution which may not be practical so sometimes people may use linear programming it can be used for optimizing the solutions it can be computerized maybe people may not be needed once the formula is there then it can be fed into the computer and then it will give the plan the only thing is uh, the linear assumptions which are used in linear programming uh, may not be valid all the time there could be things which are non-linear uh, simulation is a good way of assessing any plan so this is also heuristic or trial and error based uh, in fact computerized models can be used because the variables can be changed very easily in a simulation so it is very easy to see and do what if kind of situation what if for example uh, we do subcontracting at a certain cost what if we do not do subcontracting what if we have two more machines or what if we have uh, three people less so all those situations can be easily analyzed using simulation if you consider services aggregate planning for services so because of the nature of uh, how services are as we know 
it's going to be very very difficult generally so we already know that services occur when they are rendered demand for service can be difficult to predict so a lot of variability capacity availability can be difficult to predict so not only demand sometimes capacity also may be difficult to predict uh, labor flexibility can be an advantage in services so like in retail shops if at certain stage we need like uh, more people at the checkout counter or less people so those things can be adjusted very quickly because of the flexibility once aggregate planning is done and before master production schedule can be developed there is a stage in between called disaggregation so to move from aggregate planning to master scheduling we need to do disaggregation which basically means as mentioned earlier in aggregate planning we have overall plan like let's say 240000 vehicles in one year for that the aggregate plan is done so at this aggregation it has to be broken down now so how many for example f150s will be made or f250 or f350 uh, trucks will be made by ford for example and how many focus or how many other vehicles how many suv so all that break up will be done at this aggregation stage so that master production schedule can be developed in more detail determines quantities needed to meet the demand based on those break up for different product lines so it has to obviously interface with marketing uh, capacity planning production planning and distribution so they have to basically interact with these people in order to do a good job so when they interact with marketing for example it in fact helps marketing to make valid delivery commitments so they know that what can be achieved within what period when they are talking to uh, maybe future customers they can give a good information to them in fact uh, while talking about the delivery commitments lot of problems occur if we promise too much and we are not able to fulfill those promise in appropriate manner like within the time or not able to meet the quantity so once they are involved at this stage it helps them to make valid delivery commitments now job of any master scheduler uh, is to evaluate impact of new orders so when the plan is already there for let's say a week or two weeks or a month or two months then when the new orders come how where do they fit in can we fulfill the order and things like that has to be evaluated provides delivery dates for the orders so once they evaluate then they are able to give their judgment like how much time it will take and also they deal with the problems like there could be some production delays so whenever there are production delays maybe a critical machine breaks down then they have to modify the plan so revise master schedule based on that and if there is a insufficient capacity then production and marketing people have to be alerted in advance so that there is no uh, problem or major problem with any uh, good customer so this is the master scheduling process uh, the inputs are beginning inventory then what is the forecast value what are the customer orders and the output is the projected inventory and also master production schedule or simply called as master schedule and uncommitted inventory so one example is given for june and july so you have the forecast values so 30 units in june every week and 40 units in july every week and the customer orders are available for next few weeks as you can see so suppose the beginning inventory is 64 when we have forecast and customer orders out of the two we look at the higher value so because 33 is more 
So we do 64 minus 33. To calculate projected on hand inventory, we do 64 minus 33, which is 31. So we get this 31 here. So we have an inventory of 31 at the end of period 1, or you may say at the beginning of period 2. So we have 31 for period 2, and out of the 2 forecast and customer orders, forecast is more. So we do 31 minus 30. So that gives us 1. In the next period, because the inventory is only 1, and the demand for forecast is 30, so 1 minus 30, we have a shortfall of 29 units. So this is how projected on-hand inventory is calculated. Uh, let's look at the last slide, which is time fences. So these are points in time that separate phases of a master schedule planning horizon. So generally, there are three periods. So the red one is frozen period, which means that the changes are not possible at that stage because the materials which might be needed has already been bought. Maybe half of the production is already done and things like that. So if any change is to be made here in this zone, it is going to be extremely expensive for the company. But then if it becomes very important, like if one of the biggest customers, they want something done which requires a change in this period. so. In that situation, sometimes they can still do it, but they will need approval from one of the highest people there, maybe vice president or somebody very senior. Slushy period is, again, if, uh, many of the things are done, uh, like order has been placed probably, and the material may arrive in one or two days, and everything has been planned. But at least this is uh, slightly better than frozen period. You may still have some small room for manipulation or changing the plan. And then the liquid time frame is basically all the changes, if required, are being done on paper, so they are not very expensive. Like if a customer says that I want something, uh, maybe 200 items in period 9, so obviously that can be very easily, and the plan can be very easily changed. and customer order can be incorporated. Now let's look at some of the problems from the book. So there are six periods. So you have one, two, three, four, five, and six. And then the last column we use for total. Now the forecast based on the problem is given. 200. So this actually relates to our example 1 with slight modification. So our output, regular, overtime, and subcontract. So it was 300, 300, and 300 for first three periods, but slight twist after fourth period, so that the total is still 1800 output minus the forecast as we calculated earlier will be slightly different it will be same for the first three periods but then we have negative 400 because nothing is there in no output in period 4 then you have negative 50 and 250 now coming to inventory so we have beginning and ending. And then you have zero each. Ending is 100, 200 for the next two periods. And there's nothing available after that. So average obviously is going to be 50. So average, I'm adding and dividing by two beginning and ending inventories. So 200 plus 200 by two is going to be 200. So the total here is 500. And then backlog. So zero for first three periods. 
and then you have 250. Now to calculate the cost, so we have regular over time subcontract. Because we have only regular, we have $600 each. And then we have 0 and 900 each. Then inventory, based on the average, if we calculate 50, 150, this is 100, 0 each. So back order at 5 will be 0, 1000, so actually this is 200. Zero. So the cost for each period you can now add 650, 750, 800, 1100, 2150, and 900. So the total is 6350. So that's the cost. So you can see this is different from what we had in example one. So you can see any change in strategy provides change in the final cost. Let's look at uh, number three. So in number three, you also have actually costs associated with overtime and subcontracting. So again, you have six periods and four costs add up to 1800. And then you have output. So that is for regular overtime and subcontracting. I'm just using the acronyms. So you have 280 each based on the problem, which gives a total of 1680. Then we have 00, 0 40, 40, 40, and 0, giving a total of 120. And subcontracting is 0. Then output minus forecast so we have 80 80 20 negative 80 negative 180 and 80 similarly inventory beginning ending and average and then backlog 15 0 so the backlog is 80 in the fifth period. So 520 and 80. So this way uh, you can see the calculations are simply uh, addition and subtraction, so not very difficult. And then you can apply the cost numbers given, and this should give you a total cost, overall cost of 4640.